Amen. All right, if we will, let's grab our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I've been looking forward to starting this study with you on a Sunday morning. And again, what great riches are in this text that we will look at today and really the whole study of the book of Ephesians. You can entitle the message today, Our Riches in Christ. Our Riches in Christ. And we're actually just going to look at three verses from this passage this morning, the first three of Ephesians chapter 1. I'll ask you, though, this question this morning. I'm not trying to get personal or asking you to answer out loud, but I'll ask this question How rich are you? How rich are you? And I'm not referring to earthly riches, how much is in your bank down the street. I'm asking the question, how rich are you? And and the point is this, is if you are saved, if you have placed your trust in Christ and you are now in Christ, that's your spiritual position today, starting today and through the remaining of this, this passage and in this, this book of study, you'll find out more and more just how rich you actually are. Your richness from God, your richness towards God. Think about this for just a moment, um, if you will. This purpose of this book, the book of Ephesians, it is actually broken into two main parts, if you will. The first three chapters will be more theological, get this, of explaining our position in Christ. The spiritual blessings that we have because we have trusted in Him as Savior. Then the next three chapters will, get this, they will be even more practical and deal with what our practice should be now that we are in Christ. That is um, what God has, first we see in the first three chapters, what God has done for you in the last three chapters, now what He wants for you to do in the church. Amen? He wants you first to be settled on who you truly are in Christ, the rich blessings you have in Christ, and then, then that you know that He wants to show you what He wants you to do in Christ. He wants to show you your role in his local New Testament church. Amen. I love this. Think about this. Ephesians was actually written to do this. To reveal to us our riches in Christ and in his church. But give this. Ephesians was first addressed to those at Ephesus. But also addressed to us today. All of the redeemed throughout the ages this is his inspired word and instruction for you and me. But get this, it was, addre- it was addressed to a group of believers who are rich beyond measure in Jesus Christ, yet they were living as beggars. And only because they were ignorant to their great wealth. Think about that for a minute. I think all too often today, even us as believers in this current generation... I think we, we sometimes forget who we truly are or we just in, from the beginning remain ignorant to who we truly are in Christ, the blessings, the riches that He has given us, and we walk throughout life defeated. We walk throughout life unfulfilled. We walk throughout life um, not as more than conquerors that we truly are. We walk throughout life not thriving in who Christ has made us to be. So sometimes I think we're ignorant to that wealth, but let us not be today. Sometimes I think we forget who we truly are and what we are here for, but let us remember today, amen. But sometimes, my friend, we get distracted. Sometimes, my friend, We get all of our focus, all of our energy on simply and only the things that are below. This world that is passing away, everything we see is dying. It's going to be gone. So today, if we're distracted, may today, may we set our mind on the things 
that are above. Amen. On our riches in Christ, on who we truly are in Him, and may we be about giving our life today to living the life that is more than just what we see here below. Amen. Talk about a fulfilled life. If you will, let's bow to the Lord right now in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you today and we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word that we're about to look at in a moment. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that will teach us these truths, that will teach us all things, and that will allow us to understand your word and that will empower us to live out your word. If there's anyone here today that's lost, they are not in Christ, they have not been saved, if they have not been given these great riches that you, eternal God, giver of all things good, are offering them today, may they be saved today. But for all of us, your people, your church that are saved, may we truly see who we are and may we be about the lives that you have called us to be about. Please be with me. Preach your word. Make known clearly your word, but again with all of us as we apply and obey your word. We love you. We thank you. We praise you for all you are and all you've done. And it's in your son's precious name we do pray. Amen. So think about this, you again, you get the full idea of what this study is going to be about, letting you know of the riches that you actually already have. And think about this, before we read the text, I'll share with you real quick, Ephesians has actually been called, get this, the profoundest book in existence, and the outs of the New Testament, get this, since since it explains to us our riches In Christ, some have also coined the phrase for the book of Ephesians and entitled it the Believer's Bank, the Christian's Checkbook, and the Treasure House of the Bible. Amen? The truth is that this book is just like all of the Word of God. This book is especially rich. It is especially profound And it is very good. Amen. And I hope that we are on the edge of our seats and intently listening to what God has to tell you today again about who you are and what plans he has for you and what riches he has poured out on you. If you will, let's look at these first three verses. And since it is so rich, again, this is all we're going to be able to scratch the surface of this morning is the first three verses. If you will, let's read. Ephesians 1 and 1, it says this. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. So if you will, let's now scratch the surface and see really what the text is bringing out today. But if you will, let's look at that first verse. Paul, who is writing this? Paul is. Paul is, as as he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Think about this for a minute. Thankfully, get this, God called Paul. Jesus handpicked Paul. He called Paul. He actually spoke to him on the road, right? And he, he dropped him to his knees. He blinded him with the light, but then opened his eyes. He saved him. Think about this. Is Paul was the most notorious persecutor of the church of Christ. Amen? But then when he encountered Christ himself and was forgiven and shown 
great grace, he then became the most notorious missionary of the church. Amen? And I love this. God used him to write the book of the New Testament. Numerous epistles to the Lord's churches was written through Paul. That's part of him being an apostle. And think about this is um, he's an apostle. Get this uh, chosen, set aside for this great task and specifically with him writing revealed revelation to you and me. God's given us his inspired word and he's using the vessel of Paul here. And um, think about that is he was actually the apostle born in due time. He was apostle born later than the other apostles of Jesus. But think about this. As it said, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, chosen of him. And get this, it was all by the will of God. It was God's will. It was God's plan to, to choose Paul. And think about this today. We do not have apostles. The age of that was right here in the time that we see it. In the, the spreading of the, in giving of the inspired word for our, for our church, we have the complete word of God. Amen? We have all that we need. We have the word of God and the spirit of God. But I love this, that um, today though we have been given as the church, we've been given pastors who pastor and teach the word. Each church we've been Blessed to have pastors our whole life, right? That get this, and Ephesians will go into this later in the chap chapter 4. Will tell you that he's given these gifts and the offices to the church. God's given you men throughout your lifetime that are dedicated to look over your soul. To study out the word of God and to teach it to you. To feed you the spiritual food that we need. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, I've been thankful for God's pastors. He's given me throughout my lifetime. And get this though. These men are called of God by, called of Christ by the will of God. Again, no, there's no pastors. There's no apostles today. There are pastors today. Also what we'll get into in chapter 4, but again making this applicable to us today. If you were saved, if you were in His church, if you're saved, period, think about this. God's Spirit has gifted you with a gift or gifts. Amen? And think about this. We see Paul right here. He's surrendered to the will that God has for him, is he not? Amen. He's sold out. He's faithful. But my friend, each and every one of us as believers, after He saved us, He gave us gifts. And what are we to do with those gifts? We're to use them in God's local New Testament church. We're to use them, get this, to love and to serve. To see the church built up. To see the church growing. To be about the work that God has for you and me in the church. And the question today remains, that's the, that's the will of God. He said it. He's given all believers a gift or gifts. But the question remains today, are we like Paul, surrendered to the Lord's will for us in and through the local New Testament church, and are we being faithful to serve? Amen. And if we are not, today will today be the day that we surrender ourselves once again. God, I, I know you have a will for me. I am surrendered to that will. Use me. Think about this. Specifically, who is he writing to? But before we move on to that, don't be discouraged. I know we are living in trying times, but that is no excuse today but do not be discouraged. God has given you a gift. He has a will for you in His church. And since that is true, he, he will give you the power to do whatever He has put before you to do. Amen. Do you believe that? I do. 
We can't do it apart from Him, but with Him, we can do all things. So don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep abounding in the work of the Lord until He comes. Amen? Will we do that? But as we see what goes on next, what happens next, it says again, he's, he's Paul, he's the apostle of Jesus by the will of God. What's that next phrase though? To the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Again, who is this written to? My friend, again, saints, the word saints is loosely used today. In the religious circles and also outside the religious circles. But do you know what the word of God says who saints are? Believers. Amen. If you are saved, you have been made a saint of God. You are his child. You are set apart to be holy. You're a saint. May we live like the saints that he has called us to be, but that's what he's saying. He's speaking to the saints. He's speaking to the believers specifically that were at Ephesus. And also it says to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Get this. Um, Ephesus was right here on, on the border, uh, a water border. But even further inland though was all of Asia Minor. And he's also addressing this letter to those a little bit further up inland. The believers in that region. That was the original audience. And I love this though, even the faithful in Christ Jesus. Again, this is many times a phrase referring to those who are in the faith, those who are saved. But you know the ones that are getting this teaching that he was giving out? The ones that were faithful to come together, amen? We need to come together. As a matter of fact, the will for you is to be in His church and to be called out and to be called in. We're called to come together. And again, as He has, he's, he has planned it, He's given you teachers to, uh, and pastors to preach the Word. He's given us the Word even through His church. Can we study at home? Yes. Are we to study at home? Yes. Are we to take what we are taught here at church and go home and dig in it deeper? Yes, amen. Search the Scriptures daily as the noble Berean believers. But my friend, may we be faithful to come together. He's called us to come together. As a matter of fact, for His church to be the church that He has planned for it to be, it requires you and me being faithful to come together. It requires us being faithful to grow day in, day out, week after week, year after year in the teaching of His Word. To be faithful, get this, to serve with our gifts. To be faithful to serve in positions and ministries in the church. Amen? Will we be faithful? If you will, let me share this. This is very important to know about the whole book of Ephesians. This is one piece of information that's very key to understanding the original audience of which he was writing. Again, this was the church at Ephesus. Get this. This is something to know about the city of which they were called out of. That they were saved. Here's a little bit about the city um, here's a little bit applicable to what we're studying today. Ephesus was the political and commercial capital, get this, of the Roman province of Asia. In the whole of the Roman Empire, within the province of Asia, it was the most political and commercial capital of that region. And get this, in the whole Roman Empire, which was the Roman Empire of the world, it was second only to Rome. It was, it, get this, it was very wealthy is the point. They were very wealthy. They were very rich. But in essence, get this, uh, he's writing to the original audience and he's saying, look, 
You think you're rich monetarily. You think you're rich in this world, but listen, let me tell you how rich you are in Christ. Amen? My friend today, we've been blessed even here in America, have we not? We are considered one of the most wealthy nations in the world. We have been blessed with abundance, have we not? Are we thankful? But let me tell you this, it doesn't matter how rich you are in this world, how much monetary wealth you have in your bank down the street, let me tell you, let God tell you how rich you are in Christ, amen? What better wealth? No better wealth than that. And that's where our minds to be set. That's where our focus is to be. If you will, what does the next verse say? Verse 2, grace be to you and peace. From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Pause there for a minute. Paul uses this phrase or a very similar phrase in many of his letters. And he always pairs these two together. May grace and peace be given to you. Would that be a nice thing for you to say to each other? Would that be a nice thing for a pastor or teacher to say to the church family? May grace be given to you. May peace be given to you. Think about this for a minute. What is he really saying there? This is, this is rich too. What he's really saying there um, is, is think about this. You actually did receive both. At the moment of salvation, you receive grace, amen? You receive the great riches and the great blessings, the great gift of God. You were saved. You were given His Spirit. You were made alive. You were forgiven of all sin. And the list goes on of this riches and this gift. But guess what? You also were given peace. And let me tell you this, without salvation and without grace, you can't really have peace. You might think you do, but let me tell you, it's not real peace. I love this, my friend. The moment you receive the grace of God, the moment you are saved by grace, you at that moment had peace with God. Amen? And let me tell you, that is the most re important relationship that you need to have peace in. We're to, have, we're to have peace in life. We're to be peacemakers. We're to do all that we can to have peace with one another, but with, without peace with God, it's hopeless. But think about this. So that's really what we receive. We did receive that at the moment of salvation. But again, he's writing to believers, may you be given this. So what is it really saying? Think about this. Just even simply speaking about it, grace is, grace is what? Grace is getting the gifts and the goodness that you and I don't deserve, right? Mercy is God holding back the judgment that we do deserve. And God gives us that at salvation, but then He pours on an abundance of grace. And again, grace is getting what we don't deserve. It's the goodness we don't deserve. Amen? So think about this. Paul is even saying, may, you, may God deal with you May God give you all the good things that you don't deserve. I'll take that. Because let me tell you, my friend, none of the good that we have do we deserve. We don't. If we want, th if we want what we think we're entitled to, let me tell you, that's hell. That's death. But by the grace of God, He has given us so much. But think about this. He is saying that phrase, though, may you receive even more grace. May you receive even more peace. The way I understand this, my friend, get this. 
may we increase in realizing the riches that God has given you and me. May we get this. May we realize, may our sight be focused on the grace of God. And may we be settled in and know that God's grace is sufficient for everything. Do you believe that? And my friend, we lose sight of that fact. We lose sight of the fact, my friend, that we have been given the grace of God and that even with Paul, he knew it. He suffered. He went through a lot, but he realized that, God, your grace is sufficient. I've got everything I need in you. Amen? May you know that today. That's my prayer for you and me today. May we more fully grasp that. God, I have your grace and I don't need anything else. Think about this is once you take hold of that, once you realize the grace that you have been given and that it's more than enough, let me tell you how much peace you'd have. Amen? Do we realize the peace that Paul had? Even this letter writing while he was in imprisonment and shackles? May Again, may we realize this is that if we want even more and more peace, we need to be focused on how great God's grace is and that it is more than sufficient. I'm going to read one more verse of Scripture, though. 2 Peter 1 and 2 sheds a little bit more light on this phrase. 2 Peter 1 and 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Amen. So he's not only saying, may you be given grace and peace, but he's saying, may it be multiplied. May it come in great abundance. May it be multiplied. And what does he say though next? And may it be multiplied unto you, get this, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So what is that saying? Again, my friend, you've been poured out grace. You've been given peace. And again, he's speaking to believers that already have knowledge of God and Jesus. Amen? We're not saved if we don't, have, if we don't really know him. But guys, get this. That grace and that peace is multiplied when you increase in the knowledge of God and of Jesus. Amen? That is why, as we said earlier, we've really got to get into this word. We've got to get into seeing how rich we actually are. We need to see how rich the grace of God truly is. We need to be, see it time and time again and be convinced it is, I, it is more than sufficient. I've got God. I've got His grace. I lack nothing. Amen? My friend, I believe that's truly the way to multiply grace and peace. I think sometimes in our life when we fail to have peace, we're in situations that are beyond difficult. We're maybe in situations where we feel like giving up. When we feel like we can't press forward, that we can't have joy, that we can't be content. Well, I think many times it is because we have lost sight of who God truly is and how rich His grace is. Amen? And that it's sufficient. If you will, let's move on to this next verse. Verse 3. I'm going to read it one more time, if you will, and then we're going to break it down. But notice this, verse 3 is one of the most key verses in this whole passage. Not only is this the key verse in this whole passage, but get this, it will include a phrase that we will further discover in just a moment. It will include a phrase of in Christ. And this is the key phrase in the whole of the book. It is key to everything that we're going to learn in this book. And again, we'll break that down more in just a moment. But uh, that phrase, in Christ, will be repeated 
time and time again throughout this whole book, but here is really what that means is, get this, is that God has given us these riches, given us these blessings, but if you are not in Christ, you will receive none of them. Amen? Here's the truth. That all people, we are naturally in a position. We are naturally in Adam. We are naturally in sin. We're naturally lost. We are naturally awaiting condemnation. That's the truth, right? But get this, once we realize our state and we repent of our sin, get this, and trust in Christ, our spiritual position changes. We then get this, are placed permanently in Christ. We're not in the first Adam anymore. We're in the last Adam. Amen? Where sin came in the world through Adam and one man, we now have forgiveness and life and salvation in Christ. The last Adam. Aren't you thankful? So now, if you are saved, you are in Christ. That is where you stand before a holy God. And let me tell you, you don't want to be anywhere else. You don't want to be in sin. And I'm just going to tell you, you don't want to be standing and trusting in your righteousness but instead the righteousness of Jesus. Amen? I love this, is that Jesus freely bore our sin, took what we deserved on the cross. He wore it. He wore it. And now get this. He offers to all who will trust in Him, He offers you to wear His righteousness. Amen? And let me tell you, He is perfect. He is sinless. He is without spot. He is without blemish. Right? That's full righteousness. And let me tell you, He is accepted of the Father because He's sinless. And again, He offers that to you and me. And when we accept His righteousness and we wear His righteousness by faith in Him, we now have that spiritual standing before God. Amen. And we're kept there. So again, the question is asked today, where are you? Are you in Christ? Are you in Christ if you have not repented of sin and trusted Jesus as personal Savior and your trust is in Him and Him alone, then you're not in Christ. And you can't come before a holy God. You can't have eternal life outside of Christ. So again, take in mind as we study this, you will see this phrase time and time again. And let me tell you, None of these blessings of God can be received of you if you are not in Christ. But He offers it to you today if you would trust in Christ. What does this phrase mean? Let's break it down. This phrase, this whole, this whole verse seen in verse 3, it says this, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us before we break down the rest of it, start off with that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us. And He's blessed us in Christ. So think about that. And the, the chapter to come is going to tell you of more and more of these blessings. It's going to tell you that you are, get this, you're forgiven. That you're chosen that you're redeemed, that you've been given an inheritance. And the list goes on and on. And he says that, look, he's blessed you with all these things in Christ. Amen? And you know what God is worthy of because he's done that? Blessing. That means praise him. Amen? 
So think about this as we grow in this study that we're looking at today. As we grow in this, if, if we don't come to a point to where we can't help but praise and bless him for what he's done for us in Christ, I don't think we've listened. I don't think we've took it in. So again, blessings and praise are due to God who has given us His Son and now that we have received His Son, we have been given, what does it say? He has given us, He has blessed us. Let us bless Him because He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. What does this phrase mean? Think about this. How many blessings and riches has He given you and me? I listed just a few of them. And Lord willing, throughout the study, we'll see more of them. And not all of them. We'll see some of these riches that we have in Christ. But get this, He says that you have been given all. All. Not some. Not He's holding some back. No, you have been given all blessings, all riches in heavenly places. Amen? And He's given all of that to us when we placed our trust in Christ. He's poured out His love. He's poured out His abundance. Get this. There's plenty to go around. It's overflowing. He's not going to run out. Amen? Do you believe that? Get this, He is God. He is creator of all things. He is the giver of everything good. Amen? Let me tell you, He's not running out. And He is not holding back. He has given you all things. I, my mind immediately goes to Romans 8 and 32 and how rich that passage is. But it says this, Talking already just clustered right in between riches found in Romans 8 that you have in Christ. It says this, it says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Did you hear that? Even there it says that God... Father God gives us all things through Jesus. But it also said, though, that He didn't even spare His own Son for us. He didn't hold back, get this, the greatest gift He could have given. He went as far as offering His own Son. His perfect Son. On the cross for you and me. Amen? Don't lose sight of that. And may we fully grasp what that means. If we went as far as to give you the greatest thing He could have given, His own Son, don't you believe that He is going to give you all things? Amen? Why would He hold back anything else that is within His resources if He gave you already His own Son? Amen? So that is how many blessings, that is how many riches we have. We have all. But also get this, what kind of blessings are these? What's the nature of these blessings and of these riches? Think about this is, we, we have before us, we have with us, we have us before us the uh, Fort Knox of spiritual blessings. Get this, what Fort Knox holds, gold. That, that place has nothing on the storehouses of riches that He has given you already. Amen? I'm just going to tell you what all that Fort Knox holds, it's all going to perish. It's all going to melt away, amen? 
All of the riches that we have in our bank account, it's all going to be gone. It is a tool to be used in life. It is not the abundance of life. So think about this is all of those riches, they come in pale comparison to spiritual riches. Think about this for a moment. It's, we know that they are spiritual blessings. And the moment you got saved, you became alive spiritually. And get this. A spiritual bank account was started. And again, that bank account is full. But think about this. It says it is in heavenly places. I'm just going to tell you it's spiritual. It is positioned in heaven. But think about this is the fact that it's in heaven, that is the most sure sign that it's going to last. Amen? Again, as we said, everything that we see here below, it's dead, it's dying, it's corrupting, it's passing away. I would think of this verse as well. 1 Peter 1 and 3 says this, Blessed be the God, very similar to what we see here, blessed be, all praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us. He has, been, he has born us again. He has spiritually brought us to life. It says, unto a living hope, a lively hope, by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Again, if your trust is in Jesus, you've been born again. You've been given His Spirit. You've been quickened. And my friend, that's a lively hope that's not passing away. No matter how bad life gets, our hope is still alive in Christ. But what has He also given us? Verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible. He's given you and me a spiritual inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled and fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You're getting a foretaste of it now. The inheritance, the riches that you have. You've already been given eternal life. You're spiritually made alive. And you get a foretaste now. But there's coming a day where you're going to see it all face to face. Amen? But get this, that inheritance it says is incorruptible. It's undefiled. Faith is not away. So it will not perish. It will not spoil. It will not fade. I'm just going to tell you, I would not have my riches be anywhere else. Amen? I think oftentimes we spend too much of our focus storing up treasures here below where everything's passing away. Too often times I think we go throughout life, get this, picture this if you will, this image, mindlessly sitting on the shore building a sandcastle that is slowly but surely being washed away. Amen? Too often do we, we think of our riches here, do we focus on our riches here, and we, we fail to lay up treasures in heaven. First, we fail to realize the riches and abundance we already have in heaven, but then we also fail to lay up treasures more treasures in heaven. And what is this? Again, in our everyday life, you can lay up treasures if, you, if we do this, if we focus that, look, I'm here to please God. Can we live in a way today? Can we interact in a way today? Can we work in a way today that is bringing pleasure to God? Can we shine His light today? Can we share His love today? Can we share His gospel today? Amen? That's laying up your treasures in heaven. 
May we abound in good works in the church and outside the church that will lay up treasures in heaven. May we also do that all in love so that we can actually lay up treasures in heaven. Here's another scripture that comes to mind, 2 Peter 1 and 3, if you will. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Again, my friend, he's given us all that we need. He's given us these great riches. He has given us everything that pertains to life. Truly abounding in the life that God has for you and me. Truly growing in and abounding in godliness. That's some of the spiritual blessings and riches He's given us. Here's something I'm convinced of though. Too often, we don't claim those riches in Christ. Ephesians has actually been called this. It's been actually called the Joshua of the New Testament. Why? Well, because both books, get this, are God's people moving in to possess their promised and purchased blessings. And my friend, I, I, again, I fear that too often we don't realize really the riches that we already have in Christ. We walk around. We walk around as beggars, poor paupers. And this is why I think we often don't realize it. Again, we often don't get in the Word and see it. This also I find in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. Listen, if you will. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. We can't even imagine, we can't even wrap our minds around all the riches that He has prepared for us that are saved. All that would receive Jesus as Savior. And get this, verse 10, it says, but God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Think about that. I'm convinced of this. This is why He's given us the Word right now. This is why He's given us access to study the Word daily. And this is why He's given us the Spirit so that we can listen, so that we can read, and so that the Spirit can make known to us by what we read in His riches all of what those riches entail. Amen? But again, the question remains, will we commit ourselves once again to being a people that searches out those great things, who will read, who will intently listen, who will dedicate themselves to preaching, to teaching of the Word, and also to the searching out of Scripture daily so that we may really see all of these amazing riches that He has given us. If you will, let me also remind you of this. All of those riches are in Christ and in Christ alone. Amen. As we stand, the question is, are you in Christ? As we sing.